and I am happy to bring in uh, Rita McGrath. Hi. Hi, Rita. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, audience, I think most of you are probably already familiar with Rita. She doesn't need an introduction, but she's going to get one anyway. Um, Rita's professor of uh, professor at Columbia Business School, and she's the author of uh, several books, including The End of Competitive Advantage and Seeing Around Corners. Um, so once again, thank you, Rita. Um, and in the next 30 minutes, we are going to, or we're going to ask you to help us understand the new breed of disruptors, which was the topic um, you covered in your recent Sloan Management Review piece. So Rita, who are the new disruptors and what do they suggest about the classic theory of disruption? Well, in the classic theory of disruption, you had um, a new entrant that wasn't very good, um, and but appealed to a niche market, as I think Scott and um, uh, Michael were kicking us off with, it seems pretty recently ago. Um, but the idea was that it appealed to a different market segment than would be the customers for an established institution. And the argument that I make in the article is that the new disruptors um, are actually offering products and services in a very different digitally enabled way, but they're just as good in many dimensions as the offering created by the incumbent. So from a customer point of view, these are alternative offerings right out of the gate. So the new disruptors can actually create services or offerings that are every bit as, as good as what the existing incumbents do. Uh, they just do it in a digitally enabled, uh, very cost effective way. Well, so let's dig into some of the characteristics um, of this new breed um, and discuss why legacy methods to address disruptive com competitors might no longer be adequate. Well, I think part of what you see is these customers and companies are really leveraging digital technology. So before I get into that, maybe it's worth spending just a minute on an idea that um, my colleague Ryan McManus um, originally developed, which is that if you think about how digital has come into our lives, it has a very particular path that it's followed, right? So digital in a business sense really first started to be a mainstream issue in what was easy to digitize. So books, movies, uh, later on video, communications. And if you go back in time to the early days when digital, I put it in pin it to the, about the mid 90s and everybody had to have a website right and everybody had to have a, a browser and it was the browser wars remember those times but digital people sort of looked at it and they went oh that's cute it belongs in marketing right and so digital was often just thought of as a marketing thing then we moved into a new era where digital started to become infused into products. So if you think about a service like eBay, um, for example, um, and you know we started to have two-way communications. One of your earlier panelists alluded to that, where you know your communication was no longer corporate out; it was anybody could be part of the conversation. So you can't buy a hammer on Amazon without running across some comment that says, "Oh, I left it out in the sun, and the plastic handle melted, and you know a hammer." <laughs> so we're starting to have products that are digitally infused, digitally informed. And where we are sort of recently and now is we're starting to see digital influences in our business models. And so things become possible that never were possible before. And the economics really change. So if I were to take just an example of YouTube, right? I mean, when YouTube was first commercialized, corporate titans did not sit in their headquarters terrified at the thought of what this destabilizing technology was going to do to the future of media empires and information sharing and trustworthy television or any of that. No, I mean, what did people think of when they thought of YouTube first time out? Cat videos, right? <laughs> that's what YouTube was. And, um, um, and to a large extent, that's still one of the uses of YouTube. But if you think about it, um, what YouTube and other enabling technologies have done is they've made it possible to do at a scale uh, and at a low cost nest, if, if that's, a, that's even a word, at a scale and uh, at an eco economics that are radically different from what incumbents can do. So if I wanted to get um, a, a video message to 100 million people, and I wanted to do that 20 years ago, I would have had to be a major global media company. Today, literally two kids in a garage can do something silly on their cell phones. And as Amy said, it becomes a global meme. 
Um, and so I think that radically changes what's possible. So if I go back to your original question now about why incumbents struggle so much, I don't think it's a question of technology or money or talent. Um, I think it's a question of um, looking at the world through a lens that's informed by what used to work. And if you're looking at the world that way, it's very hard to get that alternative perspective uh, of what could be changing that you're not even paying attention to. The, the lens of what used to work, though, is a perpetual, perennial challenge for leaders. What's different about it now? Why is that more urgent? Or is it? Well, I think each generation has this clock speed of what it works on, right? So um, I think for any of us sort of got used to the way we do things in the pre-internet era. I mean, I remember when I was a, a doctoral student, I remember literally taking a, a, an entry to a um, academic conference uh, and my husband and I were literally in the car driving to New York City from Princeton, New Jersey, where we were living at the time, uh, because that was when the last FedEx delivery would leave to be the last physical submission, you know, to the last time I could get into the conference. And it has a happy ending because the conference won a, a, um, a paper, it won a best paper award, which was awesome. But, you know, if you cast your mind back to that, think about what made that necessary, right? Well, we didn't have the speed of communication. We didn't have the digitization of everything. We didn't have the, the taken for grantedness that I should be able to zap a PDF to anybody anywhere in the world, like within the next 10 minutes. So I think speed has been um, a big part of it. I think the increased ubiquity of these kinds of infrastructures. Um, I mean, if you go back to, again, go back to the 90s, uh, how did we even get on the internet, right? Was, remember AOL, right? All those, those disks that came to you in the mail. Um, and, um, um, you know, we kind of forget that that this infrastructure has all been built up around us. And so it's it's really speed, it's ubiquity, it's the interconnectedness of things, as a couple of your panelists have referred to. Um, we, we make a lot of individual decisions without understanding how they connect to a bigger system. And I think that's one of the challenges people have. So when you're looking at your piece of a little system, it's very easy to overlook the problems or challenges or risks that can come up from um, another piece of it. So just as another example, Amazon Web Services, which is really the modern day equivalent of the old time sharing business, right? People forget that was a business model that existed once where you shared expensive computer time. But what Amazon's services have done is to effectively democratize just about everything. So I don't have to buy servers or hire programmers or do any of that stuff until I absolutely have to. So the speed, the ease of entry, the dropping of entry barriers. I mean, all those things I think are part of this mix. So as we as we look at the characteristics of the digital economy, as you as you clearly articulated, it, it this is going to be a terribly simplistic or, or 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 perhaps obvious question. But why have these trends, these characteristics, access, speed, ubiquity, become such a problem? for legacy companies who were used to competing on a different playing field? Um, I just think it changes the rules, right? So if you think about how you got where you are, right? Uh, in any business, there were a set of rules that you learned and honed and your craft became important over many years. And when the rules change, first of all, you may not have the capability. And I think Scott Anthony referred to that this morning, which is, um, you know, you, you you can't just wake up one morning and decide you're going to be an Olympic athlete, right? You need to you need to practice, you need to train, and I think a lot of these legacy companies are still working with a different regime. You know, they're still optimizing a different uh, path to commercialization. So I think that's one big problem. Um, the other thing I would say is some of the smarter companies in SAP, I would say, is in that category who you just heard from. Uh, but some of the smarter companies are not sitting around waiting. Um, we've talked about Adobe today. Uh, I think Adobe's really done a great job of maintaining its innovative edge. And uh, it's not that old a company. Um, you know, you've certainly seen disasters, but you've also seen companies that are really getting it. Um, Nike would be an interesting example to me. 
of, of using these new disruptive technologies to go direct to consumer, which they will tell you now is their, their that's the, the, the lead of their strategy. They're, they're calling it the um, direct to consumer assault, I think, or something like that. Um, but I mean, there's a very established, very successful company which used to sell to 40,000 retailers. And now they've announced that they're gonna go down to about 40 that they care about. So not only are they changing their own business model, they're gonna change the business model for every other entity that's ever made any money by carrying the Nike product. So our legacy companies that are able to compete effectively against, against this new breed of disruptors, you know, is there a certain DNA that needs to be present in these organizations? You cite Nike. Nike is known as an innovator almost throughout its entire existence. Yep. yep. I think that, um, yes. Uh, so I, I, companies that do this well have a really great way of balancing their investments in what I'll call the core business, today's business, uh, with investments in sort of the next day core business, which you can think of as near field businesses, and also in options, taking out small options, which are experiments you make today in order to um, uh, buy you the right to make a future choice. Now, one thing I would add that is new in the last month <laughs> is we used to think of the core business as relatively safe, relatively stable. You kind of knew what was going to happen. Next year was going to be like last year. Well, everybody's core business has now been shoved into this high uncertainty space. And um, I thought Amy's observation about the new normal and uh, you know what we're really looking for is a return to certainty. Well, you know, I can't promise when that's gonna happen. And so the good news here is we have a tremendous number of tools that we've developed over 30 years of studying innovation, or maybe even more of studying innovation, which I think now come into their own with this new, very disruptive environment, high uncertainty environment that we're in. So. I talk a lot about uh, planning, but not planning to, you know, exercise some giant humongous plan, but planning to learn. So the idea is you plan to the limit of what you know, then you stop and you say, well, wait a minute, what assumptions have I made? What must be true to get that outcome that I want to have happen? And then you take the next step. So just as an illustration, um, obviously at executive education at New York City, nobody's flying to New York to take executive education classes right now. So we're thinking about, well, could we repurpose some of our knowledge and understanding and create a virtual experience? Well, I could sit down and write out a you know $200,000 proposal with all the detail and that, 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 and give it to my dean and see what he says. But you know, does that make any sense? No. So what I would rather do is say, okay, here's what I think the outcome could be. I think we could have a very robust, much more global offering, which would be more accessible to more people. So that's the good side. And here's what I think we might be able to charge for it. And here's what I think we might make on it. Then work backward into, well, what would have to be true? Well, the first thing that would have to be true is my organization would have to support this idea. <laughs> so the first thing I did was I wrote a note to our, our dean and I said, I've got this idea, what do you think? And he said, ah, worth pursuing. So the next step was to say, well, who else in the stakeholder community would have to be behind this? And obviously we'd have to have a client that, or two that would be willing uh, to possibly consider it. So the next step was a meeting with a client, run through the idea, get some feedback. What, what do you think about things like duration and how much content should there be and what would make it valuable to you? And then the next step at which we're at right now is putting together some kind of proposal so that we have something we can think about. So what I want to just, sort of get people to understand is when you're in high uncertainty, having this big long range plan doesn't really make much sense. Now it makes sense to have a strategy. And Scott and Michael talked about that earlier, which is you need to have directionally a point of view about where you wanna go, but you wanna learn your way to doing that rather than thinking that you know the answers. Um, one other thing I'll, I'll just mention because people are very fearful right now. And I think one of the things that people are fearful of, and this extends to innovation as well, is they're afraid of failing because we have this mindset that says, hey, if you try something and it doesn't work, oh my God, that's a failure. We want to avoid that. Well, let me put it to you this way. In a high uncertainty situation, that's crazy thinking, right? You cannot predict what is going to happen right now. Even Amy, who's one of the world's greatest futurists ever, says she, even she can't predict. So if she can't predict, like the rest of us need to be very humble about that. And so think of it instead of, here's what I think I wanna learn. Here's the time and effort it's going to take me to learn that answer, is learning that answer. Now the answer could be yes or the answer could be no. Is it worth my taking that time and effort to learn that answer? Because if the answer to that that question is it is worth it, 
and you develop a hypothesis which turns out not to be true, then then you didn't fail. You know, it was just one more piece of evidence that you can use to say, okay, I made some progress in learning. So one practical thing that our listeners can do, you know, starting this afternoon is start to write down what are your assumptions about what you think is going on with whatever important decision criteria you need to be thinking about right now. And and get yourself into a rhythm of when you hit a critical checkpoint, which is a moment that teaches you something. So the answer to the proposal was yes or no, the meeting with the client was positive or not, the technical test went well or not, then go back and double check that list. And just doing that will do two things. First of all, you're giving yourself permission to learn. You're not saying, this is my prediction, and if I'm wrong, I'm an idiot, right? What you're saying is, no, this is my best guess as to what I think is going on. What's your best guess? And you can then document your progress. And I think one of the things people find really hard under uncertainty is they don't get a sense they're making progress because they haven't hit the goal yet, right? But if you can see that you're making progress toward a goal, um, I think that's super, super helpful. So I'm going to put you in the position of being uh, armchair psychologist or maybe leadership coach for a minute. I'm going to I'm going to read some quotes to you, right? That were that that um that that were that were that were pulling in. Um, if you if you if you plan for what you know, well, based on what's happening now, I feel like I know nothing. Mm -hmm. How do you respond to that? Well, I think the first thing is, you know, be, give yourself permission to acknowledge that because none of us do. I mean, I don't know about your business, Paul, but <laughs> my, what I used to spend 80% of my time doing has kind of evaporated in the last in the last month. So we're all we're all kind of in that same boat together. So take a deep breath and give yourself permission to feel that way. Then I think the next thing to, to think about is what decisions should I be preparing myself uh, to make? So all of us have decisions about how we spend our time how we care for our families, how we think we might look towards some kind of employment, how we care with, how we deal with people who are depending on us, you know, whether they're employees or team members. So I would kind of maybe go through that that list of critical decisions about what might I need to be doing next. Um, and then for each of those critical decisions, and I would keep it short, I wouldn't do more than maybe five, right? Um, what would have to be true for that decision to work out in a positive way? Um, then back into, okay, what are the assumptions that I'm making? So let, let's take some concrete examples relevant to COVID-19. Um, we could be looking at a future where you know, things go a lot better than they are or things go a lot worse than we are. But right now, I don't think we can predict that where we are with COVID today is where we're going to be even a month from now. So what could you start to put in place that would be helpful and beneficial you know, now, even if you're not quite sure where a month from now is going to take us? So just as an example, I, I've seen in my life um, just an explosion of alternative ways of connecting with people. I mean, <laughs> it's been every hour on webinars, phone meetings, you know, you name it, because people are trying to experiment to see if there's anything here that would be robust. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts, and I'm sure the audience would as well, on maybe some techniques, for lack of a better word, on how to kind of isolate on some opportunities amidst all of this noise, right? Um, where, do, where do you look for opportunity, or how do you evaluate opportunity in the kind of chaos that we're experiencing right now? Well, the, the cardinal rule here is going back to Clayton Christensen um, is what what is the job customers or potential customers are looking to get done? And several of your speakers have alluded to this. Um, any crisis produces a huge number of new jobs to be done. Um, and we're seeing just enormous creativity. There's a, a company that um, their business is making shutters, basically, and uh, nobody's buying shutters right now. Nobody's interested, but they've completely transformed their operations into making transporting and shields for medical operations. The entrepreneur that owns this business had 60 people. He was terrified he'd have to lay off. He's brought on another 150 because the scale of that has ramped up so much. So we're seeing a tremendous amount of, of creativity. Dyson, and I love this story. So Dyson decided five years ago to get into the electric car business. And at the time, now this is back to assumptions, right? At the time, the only legit competitor in that business was um, Tesla, and Tesla was a premium product. And so Dyson felt going in, Dyson the man, felt going in, wow, you know, if we can crack the code on really difficult technical challenges in electric cars, uh, that could be a very profitable plus, you know, environmentally sustainable, a lot of good reasons. So if you go through this assumptional 
list in 2015, uh, it, it made a lot of sense for what he proposed to do. Well, here we are now, uh, 2019 was when this decision was made. Um, and unfortunately for Dyson, BW and GM and all these other big, big manufacturers were going into the electric business. But here's the problem. They weren't prepared to charge the kind of premium that, that Dyson and Tesla were able to get. And so his fear, well, what, he, what he recognized after you know, a lot of effort in this was that if, even if they succeeded technologically, the prices they would get for the cars would be pushed below um, profitable levels. And you know, he wasn't willing to take on the capital to fight that battle. Okay, so that was sort of late fall 2019. So here we are now, first quarter 2020, and what they've done at Dyson is they they took in 10 days, they went from blank sheet of paper to working prototype of a new kind of ventilator. They've taken all those assets that were used for the car, transformed them like very quickly into ventilator production facilities, and the National Health Service in the UK has placed an order for 10,000 of these things. So, you know, wonderful story that kind of takes you the whole arc from, oh, my God, this business blew up in my face. My assumptions weren't worn out. Very, very painful decision. You know, they'd made a big commitment to, hey, here's an opportunity. We can actually go in and uh, capitalize on. So I know some of what I'm about to say is just language play, but but bear with me. Is competitive advantage really over? Because hearing you hearing you speak, it sounds like flexibility, dexterity and resilience might be the new competitive advantage. Yeah. Well, for a person who wrote a book called The End of Competitive Advantage, I would be, you know, <laughs> it would be pretty silly of me to say that it wasn't over. Um, yeah. So think about the concept that the word competitive advantage implies. Um, it implies, first of all, that your main goal, your main job is to have something that's better than some competing organization that you can then preserve for a long time. There isn't a customer in there. There isn't a set sense of what, what's the job or need you're trying to fulfill in there. So I've been looking for a better phrase, and, and so far I don't really have one, but I think the, 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 the focus that notion of hunting for competitive advantage creates may be misplaced. Um, so some, some more questions from our audience, and thank you to our audience for their generosity of questions. Um, Rita, what would you say is the biggest impediment to incumbent companies making the leap into new digital business models? Is it leadership? Um, is it operational? Um, you know, it's it's a combination of leadership and governance. Um, and then, you know, as, as I've said in, in the article and in a couple of other publications, we have this mindset, I think, that when we see uh, an inflection point coming or when we see something that's a threat to our business, it, leadership should be, you know, up on a horse with a sword blazing and leading the way fearlessly. And my research suggests no, that, that and I'll go back to the Nike story, right, that Nike has been experimenting with direct-to-consumer easily since the late the mid to late 80s um, so what you want to be doing is making small investments that then accumulate to real capability so i think what holds organizations back is that they first of all they don't value those options on the future that are represented by these small investments. And they don't really have a process for nurturing them. Um, and you can think of it as the innovation process, but it's not just innovation, it's any new capability to development. And what you need is you need the idea, right? And then you need some kind of incubation process where you nurture the idea to the point where it's ready to be brought into some kind of commercial use. And then the hardest thing is you have to have a process for accelerating that idea. So if it's a venture, let's just say, um, you know, in the early days, you protect it from corporate and you try to keep it like on its own and you try to make sure it's it's happy and healthy in its own little sphere. Um, as it begins to become mature and you're thinking of actually introducing it to real customers or real operations or put it into your supply chain, well, guess what? You have to open the door and embrace legal and compliance and quality and all those other things. So you have to go from having an idea, testing out the idea and incubating it to accelerating the idea so that it can become part of your actual ongoing operation. So I would say probably the biggest impediment is companies insisting on big bets, companies insisting on ROI in you know, very uncertain circumstances, those kinds of policies which actually truncate their ability to develop and nurture these options. Great. Uh, another audience question. How can you create a culture that fosters internal disruptors? Or maybe even can you create it, such a culture? Or does it have to be kind of there from the beginning? 
Well, I think you can create such a culture. And when you look at turnarounds, um, definitely you can you can see that happen. Um, I think a couple of prerequisites, and it this one really does begin at the top. And, and I'll start with um, a question my buddy Alexander Osterwalder always teases me about. It's literally what is on your senior leadership team's agenda. And I mean that incredibly literally. How are you spending your time? If you're spending your time on sending the message that it's all about operations and it's all about this quarter and keep the wheels on the bus going, your people are not stupid. They will pick up that that's what's important to you. If you're spending 30 to 40 percent of your time on what's our future, you know, what's the growth prospect? You could call it innovation, but you could call it kind of how are we going to chart the path forward? That's what people will be spending time on. So that I think is the first prerequisite. Second prerequisite is a concept Amy Edmondson you know, discovered years ago, which is people need to have psychological safety to introduce uh, disruptive ideas, to introduce something flies in the face of today's orthodoxy, if you will. And again, if you're the kind of leader that's like, don't bring me a problem without bringing me a solution, well, that's not going to encourage much in the way of disruption. So I think this connected kind of openness to ideas, questioning, being curious, you know, how could this, being willing to ask the question, how how might this be disrupted? How could we conceive of that? And then And then nurturing the people that can do that. I think those are all important qualities. Great. So amidst all of this change, both the change you identified um, in your article and then the change we are experiencing now, what hasn't changed? Oh, I think there's a lot that hasn't changed. Um, and this is, a, I'll call on Jeff Bezos, who talks about what's the foundation for his strategy. And he said, you know, I cannot imagine a planet in which any customer says, Jeff, I absolutely love Amazon, but I wish you'd sell me more expensive products and ship them to me more slowly. <laughs> you know, I just can't conceive of that. So I think the jobs that we have, to go back to the jobs to be done terminology, they don't really change, but how those jobs get met are, are very changeable. So what won't change, you know, we're going to want some notion of stability and security again so that we can invest for the future. We know that we're going to need some way of building skill and, and, and teaching people new skills to cope with whatever this future has to come. Um, we know that we're probably going to want to continue to support our families and our communities. I think there's a number of things that, that, that won't change. You know, it's interesting, the Bezos quote, right? I, I think that there actually are many of us who are choosing um, or accepting getting our goods more slowly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, because we're, we're, one, it's just the reality, but two, in, you know, um, it's a nod towards the greater good. Um, so, you know, on, on that note, perhaps a, a final thought or two on not letting this huge disruption we are all experiencing go to waste. Thank you. Um, well, I believe I've been calling it the great unfreezing, which is, as you said, if you'd asked me, if you'd asked any of us six months ago to put all this investment into remote capability and learning to do all these things, we all would have said, yeah, yeah, we'll get to that. It wouldn't have been a priority. Well, now everybody's made that investment. And a lot of our assumptions are really up for grabs. Um, the one I'm particularly um, supportive of is really rethinking our social contract. And how we allocate resources in a society. And we're seeing right now that you know our social contract's badly out of whack. So I think the opportunity to really rethink things like worker protections, healthcare, um, and where markets fail is a huge opportunity for all of us. Great. Rhea McGrath, thank you so much. This was a terrific half hour, and I really appreciate your time. Thanks, Paul. A pleasure. All right. Talk to you soon. Bye.